It is extremely loud. You can turn it down, pro. Thank you. Are you ready to go? We're ready to go. Don't move. That's all right. Um, just to let you guys know, I'm not going to be backsliding, but I am a very proud daddy today. I got a daughter who's going to be graduating, my youngest baby. So I am leaving after Sunday school, so you guys, I'm not sliding backwards. Well, I could be. It depends on who's looking at it, but, but that's quite all right. I guess we're allowed every now and then to do something important. Absolutely. And this is something important. It's a milestone. I kind of I sat down and I was going through Facebook and all this stuff. And there was a lot of things that took place yesterday. We had a, everybody knows Danny and Gail. They, uh, 50 years. They've been married 50 years yesterday. And they had a 50. And I'm sitting there going, holy cow. I remember Man, that's, I mean, they met my parents two years before I was born, and basically, and holy cow, 50 years later. <laughs> that means we're getting old. Now, now, you're getting old. You speak for yourself. All you guys who says it's for me, you're all liars. Some days are, you're right, Ron, some days are always better than the others. Especially the days when you feel good when you wake up. It's those days when you wake up and you're sore. And then, but but it's, it's, it's good. It is good. So hopefully I can um, get this done so Damien can take over. So, holy cow, where is everybody? Nice day, everybody's gone. Beautiful. Well, I, the seats are full, but I want to be able to see the people. I don't want to. So. I had Sister Sautel said, oh, she said, I want to read it out of the message. I want to read it out of the message. And I'm like, I pretty much blew her off last week. And I said, well, maybe this week I'll let you do it. She's not even here. So, but no, I'm just, I'm just kidding. But, Brother Bud, can you pray so we can get started? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you have made, that you have allowed us to rise this morning, take a deep breath, and bless your name. Father, your faith. Amen. Amen. So I'm doing um, Proverbs 7, and I'm going to do like I did the last two times. I'm going to read it again, but this time I decided I'm not going to read it out of the King James Version. Let's hear what somebody else has to say. So I, this morning I sat down and I started going through all the other versions, and there's some versions I like. There's some versions that are watered down, but... So I, I finally, I picked out one. So I'm going to read it out of the Amplified. Okay? My son, keep my words, lay up within you my commandments for, for use when needed. I like that. If you lay them up, you store them up, guess what? They're going to be there when you need them. Okay? And treasure them. Keep my commandments and live. And keep my laws and teaching as the apple or the pupil of thy eye. Bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to skillful and godly wisdom, you are my sister. Regard understanding or insight as your intimate friend. This is funny. When I read intimate friend, 
we've been talking about friends around my house. And I said, my wife says, well, you had a friend who was a girl. And I said, yep, and I married her. And it's true. So, so we can use that word intimate and friend any way you want to let your little heart desire. But my friend is definitely my intimate friend, and I love her. All right? That they may keep you from the loose women. See? <laughs> from the, adventure, the, the adventurous who flatters with, fl who flatters with and makes smooth her words. For at the window of my house I look through my lattice, and among the simple, empty-headed, and empty-hearted ones. You have nothing in your heart, you're going to have nothing in your head. So you're going to be easily seduced. You know, some people say if you get hit hard enough, if it don't hurt, that means you have no brains. <laughs> Can't feel nothing. <laughs> For at the window of my house, I looked out through the lattice, and among the simple, empty-headed and empty-hearted ones, I perceived among the youths a young man, void of good sense, saturated, sat, sauntering through the street, huh? Saltering, that's what I thought. Saltering through the streets near the loose woman's corner. He went the way of her house in the twilight, in the evening. Night, black and dense, was falling over the young man's life. And behold, there met him a woman dressed as a harlot and sly and cunning of heart. She is jubilant and willful, her feet. Stay not in her house. Now in the streets, now in the marketplace, she set her ambush at every corner. So she caught him, kissed him, and with an imputed face said to him, Sacrifice of peace offerings were due from me. This day I paid my vow, so I came forth to meet you, that you might share with me the feast from my offerings. Diligently I sought your face, and I found you. I have spread my couch with rugs and cushions of tapestry, with striped sheets of fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until morning. Let us console and delight ourselves in love. For the man is not... At home, he's gone a long journey. He has taken a bag of money with him and will come home at the new appointed, new appointed day, at the full moon. Basically, what that's meaning is, is it's a new day. He's going to come home at the new day. The good man always is going to come home at the new day. Fill in what you want. All right? With much justifying enticement argument, she persuaded him. With the allurement of her lips, she leads him to overcome his conscience and his fear and force him along. Suddenly he yields and follows her with reluctant, like an ox moving to the slaughter, like one in flutters going to the correction stocks to be given to a fool, or like a dog enticed by food to the muzzle, till a dart of passion pierce and inflames his vitals. Then, like a bird fluttered straight into the net, he hastens, not knowing that it will cost him his life. Listen to me now, therefore, O you sons, and be attentive to the, be attentive to the words of my mouth. Let not your heart incline towards her way. Do not stray into her path, for she has cast down many wounded. Indeed, all her slings are, are a mighty host. Her house is the way to Sheol, Hades, the place of the dead, going down to the chambers of death. 
I'm done. Can you add anything to it? No. It's pretty self-explanatory. Last week, I started hitting on this street. Remember? The highway, street, a path of holiness. So, basically, what I've noticed this morning when I was reading this, this woman, this harlot, she's on corners. Lyle said to me last week after we last week after church after Sunday school, he says, You notice that she owns her own corner. And it's true. And I said it well, and then I start thinking over the weeks, I've been thinking and hitting some corners. You know? And then all of a sudden I realized. On every street, there's going to be a corner. And every street, you're going to have a chance. Remember we had a preacher here one time say that there's a bus stop. Some people are going to get on. Some people are going to get off. But it's the ones who stay on who's going to make it. Right? Remember that? Remember who said that? But this highway, this highway of holiness is, it's, the way I look at it, it's a highway that everybody's invited to get on it. And it just starts narrowing down. Because what's the, what's the Bible say? Wide is the gate, and the narrowing is the way that leads unto life. And let's face it, every one of us, we're here to see life. We're here to live, we're here to become life, and we're here to give life. Now it's up to us if we want to hit these corners. The corners are intersections, and in our life, in our walk, in our path, in our direction, there's a constant flow of intersections. And on that intersection, we have a free will choice. To turn right, turn left, go straight. But quite often, the seducer, in this case, is pictured as a woman. But there are other things that seduce ourselves, that seduce our minds and our desires. And so we have that option to stop at that intersection and turn into that seduction or to keep our eyes straight ahead and remember what our goal is and our direction, our destination. And so, uh, so this is something that even though the king is speaking to his sons and he's trying to impart wisdom, it's not always the prostitute or the whore that's, that's there as a symbol of seduction. It could be anything that stops you from going to where you're supposed to be going. I take this as the last resort. Because if you look at every man who has fallen and every woman who has fallen ended up in some sexual thing. And I always wondered why. Why is it always a sexual thing would always... It, it always ends up that way, and I just, to this day, I still don't really realize there's something about it. Listen, we're all adults here. There's something about it, and I can't put my finger on it, why it drives people crazy to do what they do. Seriously. Let's face it. The pleasure only lasts for so long, and then it's over with. Then reality comes back in. You know, and the guilt and everything else and, you know, and why is it? Who knows? But he puts it in here. He puts it in this word to teach us something. Me personally, I think he would have said, okay, I got this little piece of paper. You say this, blah, 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 blah. You're saved. And guess what? Everything's going to be rosy. You get put on this highway to 
holiness, and guess what? Okay, it's going to start narrowing down, but it's just like, I don't know, if you, you ever take water and pour it in a funnel and just watch it? It doesn't, one drop isn't running over any, you know, another one. It just seems to all end up, start flowing together, and eventually it all goes right back to where it belongs. And that's the way I wish that this gospel or this Christianity or this thing is real. I wish it was like that. Because I don't like confrontations. I don't like bumps. I don't like doing things bad. I don't like doing, hey, I want the magic froggy with this twanger. But he didn't design it that way. I don't want to have to obey. Hey, I wish life would be, all I have to do is sit on my couch and watch hockey seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days out of a year, especially playoff time. Seriously, that's heaven. <laughs> to some. For some people. For some. For some, yes. Everybody put your own little that's right. quirks in, or your own little woman in there. Can I just say that, would they do marketing... Um, I guess, research and stuff on people, they'll find that um, if you pay for something, then you'll go after it. And we've heard Pastor talk about that. If, if you pay for a book instead of being given a book, you are more apt to read the book than if you That's got it for free. True. The material in it is the exact same material, whether no matter how you got it. And I'm not, I'm not saying that you shouldn't get anything for free, but in reality... Eternal life really isn't free. And your value structure is that if it costs you something, you will be more apt to stick with it and you'll be more apt to apply it. I just think it's a principle that even though it seems like this would be the easier way, we wouldn't, we wouldn't appreciate it. It's kind of like kids. When we give them stuff, I know I've recognized... Holy mackerel, I just spoiled the fire out of my kids. They don't appreciate anything. And they just want more and more and more. But when I started making them work for something, oh, now all of a sudden it means something to them. Right. You know? So I don't know. I mean, I think that that's something built, built in us that when it costs us something, we're going to be more apt to apply it and use it. That is the truth. truth. You've got to look at it this way. It costs God everything. It cost him everything. And he created everything, but it cost him everything. Well, look, look at everybody in the house today. The, this is our usual family. Because we have invested. Not only tithe money and offerings and, and gifts, but we've invested in each other. And we've received support from one another. And so the investment that we each have in here becomes valuable enough to us Absolutely. that we want to see the fruition of what That's we're true. after yeah. here. Aren't we all? Yeah. Absolutely. He's no different. I mean... That's the biggest, that's, you're right, Ron. God's looking for a return in, on his investment. Go right ahead. You guys are going to already ruin this one, so keep going. See, demon, you've got to take the mic away from people. <laughs> I'm just kidding, people. I'm just kidding. We, we need to remember, too, that our life is not our own. Okay, and I'm as guilty as anybody. We tend to forget that. We start making the free will choice and choose this. Well, what if it's not what God wants? Then we go and choose something else we want because we think we feel it in here. It's got to be God. We've got to hear the voice of God. And he lives within us. He paid that price, like Jill said. <clears throat> and we forget that he dwells within this body. And if he brings us to a corner and says, do this or do that, are we going to yield to what he is saying? And our, our, our will 
is not always lined up with God's. That's the truth. And he is getting it lined up that way. And as we yield more to his thoughts and his ways and listen more to him, then we, uh, our life is his life. It's not separate from him. The vine and the branches, what, what was being <clears throat> spoken on Thursday, man-child, the, the branch man, it's all the same thing. We've got to get the understanding that he died. He gave everything for us. And our life is not our own. And we don't like saying that. But it isn't. Don't worry about it. I just wanted to, I just wanted to read the, when Brother Bud said the investment. To me, it's like, it's not just my investment. It's everybody here and everybody who's coming in here. Because my expectation isn't just for me. It's to see my brother and my sister go on to the fullness of Christ. That's where the expectation and, and the excitement and what you're here for. Anybody else? Okay. Now you guys got me all off my track. But no, I don't want to go another week. I want to give it to Damien. He's a whole lot better preacher. But I don't, you know, go back to what Sister Carol said. I got something to, I don't know about you, but does everybody in this room hear God talk all the time? And I understand he talks constantly. And let's, let's be real about this. This Bible is full of common sense. A lot of this stuff, we need the common sense. You don't need the Holy Ghost sitting on your shoulder inside you saying, hey, don't do this. Don't you dare go mess with harlots. Common sense will tell you, don't. It's like, and let's use something totally natural. To me, it blows my mind. Why would anybody in their right mind be smoking cigarettes? After all these years of seeing what it does to people, why would you still want to put something like that in your mouth? It's like this guy I know, his father just died, just died. He drunk himself. He drank himself to death. And he's in the same boat. He's, he's going down the same road, and he's 26 years old. And I sit there and I go to him, why would you want to do the same thing? Where's the common sense? Your father said the same thing that you said when he was 26 years old. It's fun. We're having fun. Fun? Where's your father now? How much fun is he having now? Because there's an innate desire within us all to fulfill a certain area of our life. And until we can truly admit what that area is, we will find every kind of substitute to take for temporary happiness, or live in the moment, trying to substitute that real piece of, of life that's missing. Right, and that's what this harlot is. She's a temporary, she's just a temporary fix. And I haven't met a prostitute yet. <laughs> Let me rephrase that. Let me rephrase that. How many is that? Let me rephrase that. Can I make this totally clear? I have not been with a prostitute. Oh, my Lord. That slipped out faster than I could shake a stick at. Nope, you can leave it in there because it's making you guys laugh. But there hasn't been one yet what works for free. Oh, my God. This one, she might not take money. But she takes something with greater money. She takes your life. She takes your soul. She takes, she takes every bit of you. She takes your emotions. She takes everything. And the bottom line, one of these passages say at the bottom, she's making a coffin for you. She's getting you sized up, big, tall, or otherwise, and she's making you a nice, pleasant coffin. And that's what she does. 
Because if you go up here and, she, and you read, I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloe, and cinnamon, there's two principal spices that are used, are used in the anointing. So for one thing, and you can go in Brother Kelly's book, because I got it, the meaning of them, and we know what they are. But I look at it this way. The bottom line here is they're embalming fluids. They're going to drain the life right out of you, drain your blood system right out of you, and they're going to pump something what's artificial into you to try keeping you pumped up and keeping you looking like you're alive, but really you're dead. And what you don't realize is they do it a little at a time. I heard this story about this rock star once. The guy was a total drug addict. And to this day, he still is. But this is what he does. He goes in, and he gets a blood transfusion all the time. Not transfusion. He gets his blood drained out of his body all the time and gets it all cleaned up. They put it back in him so that the next tie is better. And he can afford to do it because the guy's a multi, multi, multi-millionaire because we keep giving his money. Yep. We keep buying the records, and we keep giving them. So he can afford to do that. But in, instead of fixing the cause, it's easier to get your, brain, your, uh, your blood drained out of you, get it all filtered out, and get it put back in you. But this is what this woman does. She's doing the same thing. She's draining your soul right out of you, your blood source right out of you. And instead of putting your blood source or your blood back in you, she's putting embalming fluid in you. You know the canker worm? What's the Bible say? What, what do we do to the canker war? Restore it back. Double what she has stolen from us. Go ahead, Damien. Just to comment on what you're saying, there's so much truth in it, <clears throat> but the word says that he has set eternity in the heart of man. And I think part of what you're saying is God's given an eternal perspective, and without that eternal perspective, everything is just a temporary perspective. He hasn't set temporary in the heart of man. He set eternity in the heart of man. That's the truth. So all the, all the things that Stephen's talking about, about this, everything is dealing with the temporary. It's the right now. I know we know those things, and it's easy to just quote this stuff, but the truth is, if you don't have an eternal perspective, what comes beyond this temporary existence in this shell in this outer shell, if there's nothing more than that. I just heard a man say it when I was working this week. I'm doing a car, and this man was going to visit somebody who was ready to pass away. He said he didn't have that long, and he said, but you know what? He's lived a good life. He's enjoyed himself, and he's going through this list of blah, 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 you know what I mean? And all these things I'm thinking, but and the hardest part was, and for a second it leaves you speechless because he's spewing out the temporary, the, but there's no eternal perspective in an unregenerated mind, in an unregenerated spirit. And we all know that because everybody came from that place where it was temporary. So the eternity that is set in the heart of man may even be there before you're regenerated, but it comes into right perspective when you're regenerated, that it is not for the right now. If we ever get that for ourselves, we'll actually have that perspective when it comes to others. Because the truth is, when we interact with somebody else, if we have an eternal perspective on them, we'd understand God sees the finished product in that heart. I don't ever know if they'll be regenerated or they won't, but it's not for me to decide. It's for me to say, God sees the eternal perspective in that life just like he saw it in mine. I told you he was a better preacher. <laughs> but it's the truth. That is the truth. We gotta, this is our manual. And we've been saying it for years. This is our manual. God's given us everything that pertains unto life and God-likeness. Here it is. I've written it out. Now walk it out. The Old Testament, this is an Old Testament Proverbs. It is. And the Bible says that the Old Testament was written for our learning and our admonition. We need to learn from this. And I have to agree with you, Damien. God has placed eternity in the man's heart. He was looking, this young man was out looking 
And we were, we're out looking for something to fill that eternal purpose in our life. And we look at everything to satisfy us right now because we need that. It's not so much the eternity what we're really concerned about. We're concerned about the right now. And 99% of us who sit in this room think, if I should die, it's over. And I remember, I've said it right here. If I died, I lost. But really, that's not the truth. Because if my hope is only right now, then I'm a man most miserable. And I know for a fact I said that under passion. And at the moment, it probably was correct. It was probably right. In a way, I did lose. But you know what? I'm really not a loser. Because if I was a loser, he would have never called me. And he would have never called you. But what if I should put off this body? You put off this body. Doesn't mean in the fullness of, of time that we don't, we're not going to go down and, hey, come on. It's time for you to put it together because that eternity which is inside of you, it's time to breathe life back into that thing. See, we think, and most people in the world think that, hey, if I die, it's the end. It's done. It's over with. There's no more. Well, guess what? It doesn't say that. We all need to get a new, fresh outlook on what happens in life, period. Do I want to put off this body? The days that are hurting extremely bad? Yes. But I still are not to the pain, and I still haven't been to the pain of what my Jesus went through for me. I've never been whipped. I never had a crown of thorns smashed into my head. Some days it feels like that, but that's just my thinking. Yeah. And it's usually going the opposite direction, trying to put my own crown on. Yeah. Trying to do things right that I know that are right, and lo and behold, guess what? I'm screwing up and knowing full and well I'm screwing up. Then all of a sudden I hear this little thing. Once, every now and then, I hear the good Lord say to me, you know what? My grace is still sufficient. Amen. Yeah. So that keeps pushing me on. Yes, Amen. Thank you, but I do still love the magic twangers. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to tell you a story. And I was never going to say this because my kid's in the room. But I remember when I first moved here, and I was hanging around with David and Kathy. They got married and blah, 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 and we were all having a good time, and we decided to do some stupid things. They know, and I ain't going to say it because my child's in the room. But I went and did something totally stupid, absolutely stupid. And I went home, and I said, that was a dumb, dumb mistake. And I turned around the next day we had church. And it was just church as usual. And all of a sudden the power of God fell on me and it's never fell on me like that before in my life. I couldn't see nothing. All I seen was shininess. I was just like Paul. I wasn't blind, but I just it was just phew. the light outshined everything. And that desire, what I did the day before, was totally gone, and it's never been there back again. And I liked that because it was quick, easy, and to the point. I hate these long, drawn-out process. I don't know about you, but when I read the paper, I'm a headliner's only. I can read what the article is just off the headline. But now they're starting to lie in the headlines, so now you have to read them. But I like reading just headlines. I can scam a whole paper off the headlines, get the drift of the whole article. 
but God don't do things like that. He's a very detailed guy. And he wants every detail of our life. <coughs> See? And now I'm... Yep, Damien, I am going to be done. I said when I started that 1 through 7 is one section. From 8 through another is another section. And then you got... Proverbs is broke up into three parts. We get chapter 7 under control in our lives. Chapter 8 starts out with a whole new thing. It's a whole new day. It's a new day. Because it's wisdom crying out. And it's just another cry for one thing. To get us down into chapter 31, where it says the virtuous woman. And that's what God wants us. Amen. He wants us a virtuous woman. Yes, Something what doesn't embarrass her husband or embarrass you, your mind. Yes. You don't want to be embarrassed anymore. You don't have to worry about screwing up, buying the wrong car, wrong house, wrong everything. They know exactly which one, what right thing to buy, the right thing to say. You're very well respected by man and God. You've got to remember... Solomon was, and Samuel, you read them, they were very respected. Very respected. But we also know what the end of Solomon was, right? Because he let his mind go wild. He let his soul go wild. See, it's okay when you're young, when you can fight. You can beat these down. And she has a tendency of wearing you out. It's called age. Right, Randy? It's easier to fight this battle in our body when we're young, full of power, full of might. But age and time seems to take its place and start wearing you down. It's the truth. It's the truth. Listen, I just, had, I just went through major surgery last, last year on my ankle. I went four years with a screwed up ankle. I could live with it. I could live with the pain. I learned how to live with the pain. I learned how to take my finger and move the junk around inside so I could walk and keep, because I couldn't afford to take time off work because of, hey, I have bills to pay, family to feed, just like everybody else. And I did it all in my strength. And finally I said to myself, because time, I can't handle it no more. And as soon as I gave up, see this is funny, this also happened when I was looking for my wife. When I was out looking for my own, I looked at everything and everything. But God had the right one Amen. to come along at the right time. But I had to come to the end of myself yeah. and my strength and say, you know what, God? You do it. That's it. That's an amen. And you want to know something? He did the same thing with my ankle. When I finally came to the side, hey, I took all the precautionary stuff. I went to the doctors. I got the MRI. I got all that stuff. Well, all of a sudden, God's, I said, God, driving to work, God, I just, enough's enough. I can't handle it no more. You either got to fix it or do something. And lo and behold, he fixed it. Guess how he fixed it? I did, heard it at work. So something what took place four years ago, the insurance company and their nice wisdom said to me, it doesn't matter. You heard it at work. You aggravated it all over again. We're going to clean it all up, and we're going to pay all your bills for you. That's how God works when we give up. But as long as I let my woman have full control, she was leading me one way. She's going to lead me to death. And that's only one instance. 
How come in other parts it doesn't work that way? It just seems like every, around every corner, every corner, we got another battle. And he's telling us, guess what? You just stay on that one road I told you to stay on and just let everything just keep falling off because it keeps narrowing down, narrowing down, narrowing down. I'm going to bring you unto myself. So I hope you guys liked it. If not, deal with it. The preacher man will take care of it next week. He's got the next one. So...